computer. Okay, okay. Well, my name is Ed Peterson. This is episode four or episode five of Emotions of the Therapist. And I'm really excited today with, with my guest. Um, briefly, again, my name is Ed Peterson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, certified EFT therapist, supervisor in training for EFT uh, in the field for 20 years, and just very excited about this podcast, this video, video cast. And I want to go right to my guest, uh, Dr. Scott Woolley. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit about you, Scott, if that's okay. Sure. So Scott's been a mentor to me. Scott uh, resides in San Diego, and he's really an, L, I would say, a very elder, of the, one of the most experienced therapist in the emotionally focused therapy world, EFT, which we'll talk about a little bit here. But Scott has a world of experience because he's been doing this for many years. Um, he has a very close connection to our founder, Dr. Sue Johnson. And, um, and Scott is a professor. I'm going to let, let, let him uh, tell us a little bit more about him, but I'm just tickled pink to have you here. And so Scott, would you tell us a little bit about you? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, Ed, I'm just thrilled to be with you. It's very nice. Thank you very much for having me. And I am a professor at um, Alliant International University in San Diego uh, at the San Diego campus. I've been in uh, leadership roles for much of my 20 some odd years here, 26 years, and uh, directing the master's and doctoral programs in MFT. So, uh, and I've also been an EFT trainer from the beginning of the times that we've had trainers um, for many, many years. I've had the privilege of working with Sue for almost 25 years. And I've um, also had an opportunity to train EFT therapists in many parts of the world. I've done over a hundred international workshops and uh, hundreds here uh, in the United States. And um, I have also have a, a active practice and I actively supervise. Um, so I do as well as teach. Well, how do you find the time to do all of that? That is a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. Sometimes not always very well, but uh, fortunately I've had an extraordinarily uh, supportive wife and, and um, children and I've tried to you know involve them, take them on trips with me and do other kinds of things. So they've kind of benefited by some of the privileges I've had in this area. Well, wonderful. Well that is a great introduction and um, I just say wow, that's fantastic. I won't even uh, comment except it's a real honor to have you here and, and, and also for us here, in Salt Lake City, Utah, we've been a beneficiary of Scott, who works very closely with Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen and has trained many hundreds and hundreds of therapists here in the state of Utah. And so I, I would call you a little bit kind of a godfather of uh, what, what we do. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a positive thing. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> is, that is a positive thing. So Scott, I'm going to jump right into this because I want this to be as practical as possible because we're, you know, our audience are both experienced therapists and also pe people who might just be starting in this field. And I think that people sometimes who are just starting in this field, emotionally, sometimes they don't know what they're getting into. Um, and I know that was the case for me. And so I'm going to just, I'm going to jump in here with some questions and uh, maybe a little bit all over the place, but we will, uh, we'll find a thread here to follow. Okay. So I want to start from the beginning, which is a quote from Dr. Sue Johnson. And with this quote, Scott, I would love, it's a very broad, difficult question, but I'm going to ask you just to respond to this quote and tell us a little bit about this, what you know, and this is a question we could talk about for two hours, but what you know in it and have experienced personally in all of your different roles. When it comes to emotion and attachment or attachment theory. So here's the quote. Sue Johnson wrote this in her uh, wonderful book, Love Sense, that said this. The most functional way to regulate difficult emotions in love relationships is to share them. So one, one more time. The most, the most functional way to regulate 
Difficult emotions in love relationships is to share them. So could you respond to that and help people understand a little bit of when we talk about attachment, what we mean about attachment? Yeah. Well, um, thank you, actually. And what we mean by attachment, another way of thinking about that is connection. Okay. And um, connection and disconnection um, is really kind of the focus of attachment theory. And what Sue uh, says in terms of regulating difficult emotions is um, very much ties into attachment theory because regulating but by sharing emotions we are connecting we're connecting with another person and we're also helping connect different parts of ourselves so one of the things that ends up happening with the difficult emotions is they can be overpowering and because of that it's very easy to kind of compartmentalize them and shut them down which to some degree we all have to do at times, okay? We all have to do. If you've had a you know, difficult session with somebody and then you go into another session, um, you may end up uh, you know, having pain, frustration, whatever, and you kind of have to shut that off so you can go and be with another client. But the problem is, is if you keep it shut off, if you keep it compartmentalized, it creates disconnection from within. So, so we, we, is partly what you're saying is that we have different parts within ourselves yep. and this, this, you, you know, your hypothetical, a very difficult session happens mm -hmm. and you or I are feeling some emotion, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some fear or shame or confusion, right? Mm -hmm. But yet we have to shut it down and move on to the next client. But I think what you're saying is that an emotion is still alive within us. And so what do we do with those emotions? Well, and that's a very good question. I think there's several things. Oftentimes, depending on the time, all we can do at the moment is to shut them down, compartmentalize. But then we need to come back. We need to come back and um, be able to process them. And some of that can be done as we write our notes, mm -hmm. right? That can be helpful, but also talking with, um, with colleagues can be helpful and talking with, um, our partner, you know, can be helpful. So, and, you know, obviously we don't go into the details of the case, but we can certainly share the emotion, mm -hmm. the fear, the frustration, the pain, the shame, whatever it is that's coming up, we can share that. And the whole process of sharing it requires us to be able to label it. And we know that labeling an emotion calms the, the amygdala, calms the limbic system. And it involves being able to kind of, if we have, if we have compartmentalized it, it kind of helps getting it out of that compartment. Hmm. And if we're really sharing it, when we label it, we can also feel it and share it in that context and then organize it and make sense out of it as we talk about it. Yes, you see, and I would just say that I personally went through that in the last 17 minutes, okay? Because <laughs> I'm getting ready to do this video cast. I have a very wonderful, but very experienced um, person in you, a mentor mm -hmm. who's coming on, right? And there's, there was a little, little voice in, inside my head that said, huh, Ed, are you gonna be able to do this? Are you gonna ask good questions? Is this session gonna go well? Are you gonna connect with Scott, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see that's, and, and what I've been doing as I'm listening to you in my heart here, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of self-care. I'm saying to myself, even as you were talking, I'm, I'm, I, I notice the fear. Oh, there's a little bit of fear. And that's, and that's okay. And then I said to myself, you know, I think I'm safe here. I think this is going to go fine. I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but I think this will go fine. And then I can come back to what I call the present process. Cause I think even right here, <laughs> even 
even short, even right here, there's some present process, right? Because we're talking and, and sharing and we're going to talk and share about some things that are, you know, both personal and professional. And so that's just a, I think a window into my ex experience. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely. It resonates. And part of what was happening as you were sharing that for me is I found myself kind of thinking about the many times at this point that I have gone into doing a live demonstration session, mm. particularly when Sue Johnson's watching, oh. which can be scary. <laughs> well, yeah, and, to, have the, to have the, uh, sort of like to have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the great leader and the great, uh, the great expert watching. Right. Absolutely. Watching. And she's come into my sessions a couple of times and in front of groups or called in. And um, it's like, you know, you want to please her. You want to do a good job. You may have, you know, 100, 170, 200 people watching. And you, you want to do a good job, particularly if it's in San Diego, among my kind of colleagues here. Right. I want to do a good job. And there is a certain amount of fear that arises. And it does require what you were just kind of doing yourself. And that is, is reminding yourself that this is okay. It's yeah. going to be okay. Anyway, that's what I touched inside yeah. of me to kind yeah. of relate to where you are. Yeah. Well, right. And that's a good, really good place for us to sort of springboard from because what you're saying is that even for you uh, with 25 years experience, you can be in a situation that you're choosing to go into, which would be a live demonstration of emotionally focused therapy in front of 10 or 20 or 100 therapists mm -hmm. and a, 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 a leader or the guru or whatever we want to call Sue. The leading, the best couples therapist in the world is what people like John Cotman have called her. Right. Okay. And so maybe we could turn this around. Let's just say, Scott, you were talking to me in, in supervision. Okay. And I'm a, let's pretend I've, I've been doing emotionally focused therapy or I just have been doing therapy for six months or a year. I, I'm straight out of school. Um, you know, I've been doing EFT now for five years. So I've, I've come to a place of quite a bit of peace. I still have plenty of fear, but someone brand new and they're saying to you, wow, uh, Dr. Scott, um, I'm working with couples and my agency, they're throwing couples at me and I'm seeing three or four or five a day. Mm -hmm. And I've got a little training, but I don't know. I just get feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so, and sometimes I, I even feel like the word I came up with is, this is just a, hypo hypo that, a hypothetical tip. I felt this. I feel a little bit like an imposter. Like, I feel like, can I really help these people? And they're paying me to do this. And mm -hmm. I'm, uh, and I'm brand new. Like mm -hmm. sometimes I either in session, I get completely lost and I, I can feel myself getting scared and, and flooded to use a term. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes after I'm going home and I'm really wondering, like, did I do any good? So if I was your supervisee, I walked in, in, in your office, maybe share with our listeners, what would you, what would your advice be? And maybe what personal experience would you share to that person? Absolutely. Um, I would probably, and, and actually I do this because I also train new therapists in our master's and doctoral programs. Okay. And I, you know, I'm doing supervision right now with a group of uh, therapists that are most of whom are seeing their first clients mm -hmm. this week. Um, so um, tomorrow I will be supervising them and going over it. First of all, I would say it's normal. The pot imposter syndrome, the feeling like, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe they're paying me this is normal. That is a normal feeling. Everybody goes through that. Everybody goes through that. And then I often say, remember that they're, the clients are seeking help to be, to get better. They don't know all the theories and the techniques and all of that. They're not gonna be judging us on that. What is very important though for them is that they leave the session feeling deeply heard and understood. Mm. 
which means you have to just bring yourself in and be focused on understanding their experience. And if that's all you do in the session, you will have been helpful for them, mm -hmm. understanding their experience. But frankly, you've got a lot more to give them. But when you go in, just relaxing yourself, centering yourself, sometimes before I go into a session, probably even now, I'll just relax myself and I'll just kind of center myself in my own humanity and my own love and caring and compassion for people. And um, when, when people do that, when therapists do that, they can go in and do immense good. Mm. Um, so they can make a big difference and their training will come to them. And oftentimes, New therapists do a great job, in part because they're so anxious to do a good job. Mm -hmm, right. Sometimes I've trained, you know, so many, many thousands of therapists, sometimes very experienced therapists, sometimes even trainers and other models in their own leading people in their country. And um, sometimes experienced therapists get so caught up in one thing or another, they forget or they lose the ability to really connect with the client. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, new therapists can do so much good. Mm. So I, that's, that's kind of the, some of the things I'd say to you. Well, and my re response to that is that I really was putting myself just now in the place of one of those therapists. And I was asking myself, how would I feel or how would I experience what you just said? And I want to point out a couple of things. One is that, of course, you know, this is that you were, you were modeling what it's like to do emotionally focused therapy. You were modeling what it looks like to speak to someone and be with someone. Because you see, I felt like you were being with me, right? Mm -hmm. You could have been giving me kind of a very logical, well, you could do this and try this and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But you, you didn't do that. You used a very soft, gentle tone I noticed you slowed down with me and it made me think, oh, so what Scott is actually saying, not just with his words, but with his eyes and his face is it's going to be okay. Yeah. And, and you do have young, young therapist or what is it? A young grasshopper, like from the old uh, Kung Fu, right. that, that you do have a place in this world and, a, and that you're, you're yeah. going to do well. Well, you see, that's, that's interesting, Ed, because I was not aware of that. But looking back, I can see how he was doing that. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't aware of doing that. I just was imagining myself in that place, with my students, frankly. Well, and, and, and I get it because, you see, I've studied exactly what I think you were doing. And this brings me back to a, a Sue Johnson. Um, I think it was a podcast that I listened to a while back, and I don't know how old it is, but she help me with one thing that I think is what you actually were just doing. Mm -hmm. And that is to think about going back to the basics of emotionally focused therapy. And for me, and this is what Sue said, the basics really are three interventions, reflection, mm -hmm. validation, and what we call empathic, con empathic conjecture. Mm -hmm. And there's some others, but those are the three that I go to as my, as my go-to. Because, and here's what I think you did, Scott. I think you reflected. You reflected what I was as this, this new therapist in our role play. You reflected what I was saying. You, and then you validated when you said uh, it's normal. All right, and that just I could feel that calming me down. And you, you really, I mean, you re reflected and validated was was mostly what you did, I think, and then. You, you made some, you gave some ideas. I think you might've con conjectured, but um, maybe we could go there. Is, could you talk about, again, because even to our audience who don't know EFT or don't know about uh, attachment, therapists need to know how to use reflection and validation and even some con conjecture to do what you said, which is to connect with the clients, to be with them 
and give them this sense in your words, a, a profound sense of being heard and understood. So could you talk about how you teach and how you think about reflection, validation, and, and conjecture as, as tools that we use? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Rogers once said, Carl Rogers, and Sue quotes this often, that a good reflection is like a revelation, and that it helps you hear what you just said. Okay, it helps the client hear themselves, hmm. and oftentimes in a deeper, more profound way. Could, could you just say that one more time? Because I think that's a nugget. Sure. A good reflection is like a revelation in that it helps us hear, if somebody's reflecting to us, it helps us hear ourselves in a new and deeper and maybe more profound way. Hmm. And reflection is actually one of the most important techniques that we can use. And I think this goes across to any model, yeah. right? any approach. Uh, it's often not taught very well in graduate schools. And I think part of it is, is that sometimes faculty get more interested in more higher order kind of thinking because that's kind of where they are at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's also not easy to teach basic reflection. Um, I've kind of insisted on our own programs. We've spent a lot of time on it because it is incredibly important that people learn how to really hear their clients and reflect back the most important parts of what they say so that clients can hear themselves. Right. So even before we move on to validation, could we do a short role play and I'll be the client and uh, I want you to show people what it means to re to reflect because reflection doesn't always mean repeating back like a parrot what pe pe right. what people say. Not parrot, right, no. yeah, you're right. So I'm gonna be the client and I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw some stuff out here. So, mm -hmm. yes, Scott. Like I'm just, I'm really at my wit's end here. I don't, I don't think I can take this uh, marriage. I can't take uh, the fact that my wife dismisses me, mm -hmm. and I feel, I just feel unseen. Like it's almost like she could just be with anybody else. I don't really feel special. And this has been going on for a long time. And I, you know, we're here in therapy, but I, I'm not very, I'm not very hopeful about, you know, all of this. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so you're, you're, you are feeling kind of unseen by her. Mm -hmm. And really, if it, if I'm getting this right, um, you said feeling like you don't matter. Yeah. And somehow feeling like, you could be replaced by somebody else. It's like you. Yeah, that's the part. That's the part that really gets me. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you perform a function, and I guess I'm doing some conjecturing here too. But it's like you perform a function yeah. with her, yeah. and that is very hard. It leaves you feeling hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to be. I want to have some hope, but I just don't have much. And you want to have hope. You want to have hope. You want to have hope. And I, that's, that's important to you, but you don't have a lot. So just jumping in there, I want to point one, one thing out. You, you just did something that and I could feel it right there. When you three times repeated what I said, you said, you just don't have hope. You, you just don't have hope. You don't, or you don't feel hope. That no, actually, something, or I don't know if I caught that right, but there was something about that repetition that really hit me. I think the repetition was around, you want to have hope. You oh, want okay. to have hope. You want to have hope. But it's just hard to find it or something like that. Wow. So, and I said, I think I said, you want to have hope because you did say, I want to have hope. Yeah. And I wanted to heighten that by repeating it multiple times. Oh, okay. Hopelessness is kind of, it's an, what I would call an exit emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, it tends to disempower people. 
And so yeah, that was it, it, the whole, know, it kind of it kind of makes me feel like I don't even know why I'm here. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't even know why you're here. You don't even know why you're here. Yeah. Right. OK, you, so anyway, so, sorry. I thought yeah, we were no, going that's no, robot. that's that's beautiful. And let's keep let's keep going with this. And then let's just let people hear in our, you know, in EFT how you then and, and let's we'll, we'll we'll give you another tool <laughs> let you uh you you know you're going to reflect you're going to validate and then you might conjecture a little bit and when we when we say and maybe real quick you could give what what's the the quick definition of, of, of a con conjecture conjecture which i was starting to do there because i tend to mix them oftentimes with validation or excuse me with reflections but a conjecture is taking basically a guess mm -hmm. about what somebody is feeling or what their experience is like or what's happening inside of them. Yeah, okay, great. So let's just do this and you're gonna hear Scott um, mm -hmm. combine some reflection, validation and conjecture. So yeah, like I was saying, Scott, I mean, I'm here and you know, my wife, Sarah, who's here, I, I, I don't even know, I kind of had to drag her here. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she, we, I don't know, we've just been going round and round for so long. We've been to another therapist that didn't do a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I just hope you could help us. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so it's like, you felt like you had to, to drag Sarah here. And she, yeah, she didn't, she didn't, I had to make the phone call. She didn't want really, she came, but didn't really act like it, you know? So, so it felt like, it felt like she didn't want to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Sarah, I'm going to check in with you in here in a minute, but um, just to see your take on this. But for you, it felt like you had to drag her here. And that has left you feeling like, gosh, does she even care? Am I getting that right? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the more really kind of marriage or fixing her marriage. Yeah, it, it feels like it doesn't really matter to her. Doesn't matter. Feels like she that somehow the marriage doesn't matter, and I'm guessing by extension, it kind of feels like somehow maybe you don't matter. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Oof. Yeah, that that kind of hits the nerve, but yeah, it does. And that that's painful. My guess is, is that's very painful to feel like you don't matter. Yeah, I mean, yes, but I've it felt this way for, for so long, Scott, that I don't even, I just kind of blow it off. Yeah. yeah, you blow it off, you blow it off, and it's like you don't even want to touch that. Am I right that it's painful, though? Yeah. yeah. You don't want to even touch the pain of, Maybe I don't matter to this person that I love so much and I care so much about it. Am I getting that part right too? You That's, do care very yeah. much about Sarah? Yeah. And you want to matter to Sarah? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. Yeah. I know that. I know that. I believe that. Yep. You wouldn't be here. But feeling like you don't matter, that's an ouch. That hurts. And even though you are good at kind of pushing it down and trying to ignore it so you can go on, it's 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 there. Well, yeah. I mean, what am I just supposed to be crying? I must be, be crying. I must be crying all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah, you can't, right? You can't cry all the time, but I'm guessing you feel like it a lot. Is that right? Yeah, yeah you feel like you could cry. Yeah. Right. Somehow you want to know that that Sarah really wants to be with you, and that you matter to Sarah. Yeah. Am, am I getting that right? Yeah. This is pretty painful stuff. Okay. Because it goes deep. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder right now, Ed, are you feeling any of that? That pain as we're talking about it. Yeah. I I, th I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I know, I know I need to go over and check with Sarah and see how she, what's happening for her as she's hearing this. And maybe I, I, and just, we can step out of it and I'll be Sarah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sitting over there. I'm Sarah. 
So Sarah, what what happens when you're here? And he just I just said a lot. I mean, he said he felt like he had to drag you here. Well, that's and just not that's just not true. I just mm-hmm. you know I want to be here too. It's he always does this. He's so emotional. It just oh. he blows everything out of proportion. Okay. Yeah. So hang on here. This is good. This is good stuff. Okay. Because I hear you, Sarah, saying, uh, "No, actually, I do want to be here." And then somehow you get frustrated. You, you said, you know, somehow it's like, gosh, he blows things out of proportion. And and hang on, hang on. And I'm guessing that's not about, I don't know, what's happening in the stock market. That's about, that's not the painful part. The part is just that he, he hears these signals or he gets scared that he's not enough. And then somehow that falls on you negatively. Well, right. And, it, that's, and it's ridiculous that he's not enough. I... I I'm a strong woman. I would have left this marriage a long time ago. Of course he's enough, but I, it's yeah. like, I can't, I can't yeah. say it. And if I say it three times, it's still not enough for him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're a strong woman. I can see that. That's a wonderful thing. I'm sure that's part of the reason he, he got together with you. Okay. Um, and yet yeah, you feel like you can say this many times and it it's it it's like you can say it but it's not going to be enough Uh, in one ear out the other yeah it's almost like sarah and you tell me if i'm wrong this gets frustrating for you yeah very frustrating is that right because underneath i'm guessing and maybe i'm wrong but underneath all that frustration is is I don't know. It's almost like, how could he not see how loyal I am being to him? And it makes me angry. It, it makes me angry, Scott. It's just not, it's, it, I, it's not fair. I feel like I get judged feel- judge for this, you know? Ah, yes. You feel angry because you feel judged. Yeah. It's like, how can he think that about me? I'm giving my life. How could he think that about me? We've got kids. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. We have kids together. Ouch, ouch, ouch. So it feels like it's a judgment on you as your character somehow. Completely, yes. Yeah, ouch. Oof, that's hard. No wonder you end up flipping into anger, right? Or get angry at times. Yeah. Oh, am I getting it, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah. And yet... I'm guessing as you're hearing him say, I long to know I matter for this person. It's like, it's like, how could you not? But I'm guessing there's another piece in there because you do love this man, because you do care about this man. I do. And, and, and he drives me crazy with all of his emotions, but I do love him. And it drives you crazy. So I'm guessing there's a part of you that longs to have him be secure in your love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But somehow his emotions are hard for you. Yeah. It's been that way for a long time. It's been that way for a long time. It's been that way for a long time. Yeah. And so he's more emotional than you are. And we get in these fights and I don't even know what we're fighting about. And they last a day or two and our kids see it. And it's just, uh, that sounds exhausting. And almost a little, I don't know, Sarah, you tell me if I'm wrong, but the kids see it. I'm guessing it's almost like, yikes, almost a little scary. Like, is this going to hurt them? You know, right. Could, I mean, that, could you, could, or if he could just control himself, we just, could we talk about this when the kids aren't around, it, it's out yeah. of hand. And then, right. And then where you go in your head is, can he just control himself? Which is probably an ouch for you over here, Ed. And um, that ends up being hard, but it's like, in your mind, it's like, we cannot do this in front of the children. And all these emotions that he has, it's almost like that's hard for you. You're not used to that amount of emotion. You're, I don't know, something, you handle your emotions differently. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to in, in my work, I'm an attorney, I have to, I get angry t- too, I have to, 
I, I have to use some logic, you know. Sure, you've got to shut it down, the emotional part down at times. You know, if you're, I don't know, just defending somebody in court or whatever, you got to keep yourself focused. You got to be able to think, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And so it gets hard. So you've learned to kind of tamp it down over the years. Like, yeah. Hey. Like, yeah. It's kind of just keep it, try to keep it under control a little bit. Try to keep it under control. And you've had to do that as an attorney, but when he doesn't do that, or and when he doesn't do that, it's almost like, wait a minute here, I've learned how to do this, why can't you do this? Yeah, it feels like he's a child. Ouch, yeah. Ooh, ouch. So, and so that is like, he's a child, which means you're in a parental position and then you've lost this man that you love. You've lost your husband. I don't want to do that. I do all day long. I have to take care of people. And now I, I and you, when I come home. You long to be comforted by this man. Is that right? As your, as your equal partner. I hadn't really thought of that, but. Okay, well, wait a second here. Let's slow down on that. Because maybe I've got that one wrong. If he's a, in a child position, which I'm sure he doesn't like and you don't like, right. but when he, if he's in a child position, you can't like come and be with him. Oh, right. Be comforted right. With, by him at the end of a long day. It'd be nice to just sit on the couch and watch some Netflix or just go do something, but do we have to always talk about our relationship? Right, which just gets, gets irritating for you, right? Mm -hmm. It's very irritating for you, but somehow when when he goes into child when when you find yourself in parental role okay and you start seeing him as a child rather than your husband and the man you love that you can i don't know have fun with be comforted with connect with as adults you've lost him yeah, and it doesn't it, it hasn't helped our sex sex life i can tell you that okay yeah and right, because it's not going to help your sex life at all, which is actually quite normal when one, one person starts feeling like a parent. Yep. And kill sex. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's step out of this, um, roll. Let's talk. Can we talk about it? Can we, um, yeah. uh, let's do it. kind of, kind of deep, this. Wow. There was a lot. There was a, that was a long thing. I, uh, well, <laughs> I was, to talk about. I was feeling that one. That uh, really yeah, well, what worked, what didn't work? I'm curious about. Uh, yeah, yeah. My yeah. conjectures, because we were talking about. I would, I would say, yeah. I mean, let's talk about the conjectures first. I think, I think they almost all of them landed when I was being Ed, who you know, probably a little bit more emotional, maybe the pursuer and the relationship a little bit more. Um, I don't know. Mainly, I just felt seen. Because I I was really, I felt like my thoughts were all over the place, and I was I wasn't I, I didn't feel regulated when I started. I felt jumpy and kind of just angry, and and I just wanted to get it out. I wanted to talk, you know. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you were there. You, and then yeah, the conjectures were like when you said, "Well, I guess I, I let me guess. This is how you're feeling." Or you said. I remember you you tied it into you kept going back scott to, to saying i i think what you want is connection or i think what you want right and those questions really kind of calm me down and almost like maybe you could talk about how neurologically those questions actually calm me down sure yeah and this is when you were playing sarah right Sure. Yeah. That. Yeah. Right. Because that. I mean. I, both, I mean. That. Both. Both times I was quite ag ag agitated. But yes, let's talk about when I was playing Sarah, the attorney. Yeah, I was quite. I was just. I, I was feeling like so. So judged. You know. Right. And that was. That was a very important thing, um, because in that character you did feel judged. Is like you know. He is saying that you don't matter. So 
part of what I was doing is, I mean, Sarah was mad and I could feel it. I thought, okay, we're coming in hot here. And um, my goal is to have her feel heard. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to reflect and I was, you know, when she gave me anger, I tried to reflect the anger. Mm -hmm. And, but I know there's something else underneath. I was starting to, I, I think I matched her. Well, that's what, yeah, and that's what, what may, maybe one thing for our audience is I noticed that because a couple of times when I got, as her got a little bit louder and got a little more animated, you did too. You, mm -hmm. you came forward, and even your voice, you, you raised your voice a little bit. So what, why did you do that? I was trying to match, again, I think I do this largely unconscious, but it's called pacing and leading. Mm. And what, what ends up happening is if you match, I was trying to match you in terms of your energy, in terms of your, which comes out and how loud my voice is, mm. and your speed, using some of your own words. I was doing that because that helps you feel connected with me and me feel connected with you. Right, okay. and, and, and that's the pieces that I did. I felt like, because I think in that moment, had you just gone really slow and Work. gentle, I would have been like, you, you don't get how frustrated, you don't get how frustrated I, I am, come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, that's right. No, you wouldn't have felt like it, and we would have gone the opposite. But if, if I'm saying, yeah, I hear you're frustrating, it is frustrating, ouch, this is bad bad news or whatever i, I can't remember what i said well, but. no well and, and even scott what would you say when when that because you use that inter intervention that word a few times and it always worked when you said ouch or that hurts because mm -hmm. it sounded like you were both saying it like almost like a evocative statement but you that there was also a conjecture to it like you're saying ouch and then you're seeing if i agree and each time it was an ouch right I'm saying, I actually, at the time, I think I first starting out just when she said, yeah, it's like he's a child. And I'm listening from his perspective. Mm -hmm. He's going to feel an ouch. And it's also an ouch for her. So it's a, it's a reflection or a conjecture, mm -hmm. which actually is going to both people <laughs> at the same time. Because right. I wanted him to know that I got that that's an ouch. He's probably an ouch. And it's also an ouch for her because she's lost her husband. But yes, yes. And what I heard you do, Scott, you kept coming back when I was Sarah to, you were reflecting how angry I was and irritated, but you kept almost kind of gently putting words in there that spoke to why I was angry, perhaps, mm -hmm. and that it was because I wanted something, wow. something, I wanted something that I wasn't getting. And that's not my anger didn't know that. The anger just wanted to say how angry I, I was. But then it felt like you were almost leading me back to, well, maybe it's because you want something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, exactly. And I, that was a conjecture on my part. I was conjecturing that you wanted yeah. something different. Yeah. Yeah. And I was right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes in your conjectures, you're not right. And that's okay. You know, the client will tell you. Right. But, um, when you get it right, it's powerful because it helps them feel even more understood and you're able to lead them. Hmm. Now, I want to go back here real quick to reflection. Yeah. Because reflection, one of the things reflection does do is slow people down. It's and actually... Like, and, and like you said, you could tell that, that we, we both came in hot. Yep. Yep. And Sarah was slowing down through my reflection and my conjectures. Because my conjecture, pretty much I was getting it right. There was a few that I didn't get quite so well, but um, pretty much. And so Sarah's starting to feel heard. And when Sarah feels heard, she's no longer alone. Mm. And when you don't feel alone, when you feel like you've got somebody with you, physiologically, everything starts to change, even cognitively, the way you view the world changes, okay? Even imagining somebody being with you and really understand makes things like estimating how hard it would be to climb a mountain or how steep a mountain would be. It makes it 
so that you estimate it's less steep than if you are alone. Right. So, so wow, we've gotten to a lot here. So in, in the last about eh, maybe I've got about four minutes here. <laughs> um, I'll ask you, Scott, to sum up again. Well, I want to point one thing out is what you just said. You were also validating. You were validating that it was okay that I was angry, that I'm not crazy, mm -hmm. that almost like given the circumstance, anyone would feel that way. So I felt validated too. So maybe just again, speaking to now maybe a new therapist, mm -hmm. maybe some people didn't catch or follow everything that we said, mm -hmm. just help people, give people a few parting thoughts or nuggets about, you know, sort of what, what do you think people should or could take away as specific learning from what we just did? Sure. Sure. People need to feel deeply heard and understood. Regardless of what you do in therapy, if you can help them feel deeply heard and understood, they're going to feel better. Okay, now eventually you need to get onto some other things. But um, if you don't, if you can't figure out how to resonate with them and help them feel understood, all the other techniques are not going to be that helpful, probably. So, um, you're saying, so you're saying that if you jump to trying to do this or that or some some act or some cognitive behavioral thing or some whatever. Cognitive restructuring or homework yeah. assignment or whatever. But if you hadn't connected with me and helped me feel heard, not none of that probably would have helped. Yeah, it's not gonna make much difference. Sometimes it will, but not a lot. Yeah. On the other hand, if you feel very heard and understood as a client, you're much more likely to take other interventions from the therapist. The therapist gains, you as a therapist gain credibility with somebody. And when you've got credibility, then your intervention, other kinds of interventions, and whatever model it happens to be, mm -hmm. is much more likely to be, to work. Yeah. You see, I think it's the same thing if we've got some life coaches watching this, if we've got some psychiatrists, if we've got some some nurses who work with clients, it's, it's all the same. I and mean, it goes back to that phrase, I think, which is people need to know how much you care before they know how much you know. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Well said. You know, so, oh, Scott, this has been wonderful. I think we could go on for a lot longer. And I know this is going to help a lot of people. Um, wow. Um, I actually, sure appreciate it being on your channel, on your, your um, program here. It's been absolutely delightful. I always have great respect for you and appreciate all the amazing work that you're doing. So thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Scott, well, listen, you uh, take care and, ho and ho hopefully we'll have you back. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Bye-bye.